keep calm and play games, the British game market. GTA, Little Big Planet, Fable, Batman Arkham, what do all those games have in common? They were all developed in the United Kingdom, home of 23 amongst the 100 biggest studios worldwide nowadays. In this panel, you will learn about the opportunities in the British game market and the experiences of Brazilian companies that thrive in the UK. Pestis Duaik, co-founder of the Brazilian studio Duaik Games, and Rita D'Andrea, founder of Mundo Livre Digital, will share their internationalization experiences for the UK strategic support of the British consulate in Sao Paulo. This session obviously is in English, so if you want the translation in Portuguese, access the link for the translation here on the channel. Let's welcome our moderator, Sam Collins, Head of Membership at UKIE, Julia Koch, Business Development Manager in Inward at DIT Brazil, Creative Industries and Retail British Government, Catherine Bidwell, Michael French, Director of Game Games London Festival, Pestis Duaik, and Rita D'Andrea. The screen is all yours, guys. Have a good panel. Thank you, Bruno. Welcome, everybody, to the panel Keep Calm and Play Game. My name is Julia. As Bruno said, I'm the Business Development Manager for Inward Investment in the British Consulate here in Brazil, working for the Department for International Trade of the British Government. Uh, our team uh, supports companies and investors that aim to establish and business in the UK, and we do that by supporting with market research, table reports by sector, including creative sector in games, and we help you to find the right location to contract uh, staff and also to connect with the partners, partners of your sector. Um, we also help Brazilian companies to connect with British technologies and business solutions. So, Nice to have you all here. Welcome to our panel. And uh, I would like to introduce you Sam Collins. Uh, Sam uh, is our uh, is the rep representative of UPS uh, in the UK. Um, he's the head of commercial and membership at UK, responsible for recruiting and supporting members and helping them thrive. He has more than 20 years of experience in the creative industries, and it includes a stint at startup developers through international publishers working in a variety of commercial roles. His superpowers include connecting people and international trade. So welcome, Sam. Uh, the, uh, I pass the word to you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. I didn't know I had superpowers. That's always nice to hear. Thank you. And Bruno, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I wouldn't be talking as quickly as you, but uh, the amount of words you can get through in a minute, super impressive. Uh, yeah, I'm delighted to moderate this panel today, uh, looking at, at the UK. Um, before I introduce the panel, I'm also just going to do a little bit of a scene setting about the UK games industry, just for, for one or two minutes. Um, we love to play games in the United Kingdom. And in 2020, we spent the princely sum of seven billion pounds on software, hardware, and the culture of games, which is an amazing number. That's a 30% increase year on year. Traditionally, we would see a 10% year on year increase. So the last year, 2020, has been amazing for the games industry in the UK. And the ratio of physical to digital games is five digital units for every one physical game. So we've made that successful transition across to digital. Uh, more than that, there are over 2,300 games companies in the UK, which is an incredible number when you think about the size of the UK. Those 2,300 companies employ just over 20,400 full-time employees, and we have the largest mobile sector in Europe, which people might be surprised to hear because the UK is always thought of as being a, a traditional console and PC market. But we employ, employ more people in mobile than any other European games market. Uh, and as Bruno kindly pointed out, uh, the UK is a, a historical powerhouse for games development. Just think of those titles, Grand Theft Auto, No Man's Sky, all of the Lego games made by TT, the Batman Arkham series, Monument Valley, Forza Motorsports, Star Wars Battlefront, Formula One, Sea of Thieves, and most recently, Fall Guys. These are all amazing, internationally successful games that have been developed in the UK. And we're proud to have uh, those 23 of the top 100 studios in the world located in the UK. And today, our panel is going to explore why the UK is such a great place to make games, but also 
uh, how it's an open country for collaboration, partnership and investment. I'm delighted to welcome such a, an interesting panel today. I'm going to get them all to introduce themselves. So um, we're going to start with you, Rita, if that's OK. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and your business, Mundo Livre, for me. Thank you. OK. Yeah, thank you for uh, uh, the invitation to be here. I'm delighted to be here. And I uh, wanted to thank uh, the uh, British government because the support uh, for new companies to enter into UK, it's really amazing. Uh, everything, all the package, all the information that is provided, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, there's no money to pay that. Um, I started my company in 2019, um, working with uh, uh, customer experience. So we have uh, solutions to provide customer experience, such as you know, contact center uh, type of uh, solution, uh, but you can use like uh, omni-channel, so you are able to communicate with your customers through chat, email, WhatsApp, uh, voice, so on and so, uh, so forth. Um, and the idea is to uh, use only cloud solutions because you can uh, modernize your uh, customer uh, support uh, by using uh, technologies that are accessible to all sides of companies. We started talking with the UK team uh, uh, in 2020. In January, we opened our subsidiary uh, in, in England. Amazing. And you're most welcome. We're delighted to have you in the UK. Mm -hmm. Now, another individual who's made that transition, I think, uh, uh, are you in Huddersfield today, Persis? We're coming to you next. Is that where you are today? Hello, yeah, Huddersfield. Everybody asks me why Huddersfield. That's I'm going to ask you that later. Let's move on. <laughs> Tell us a bit about your company. Let's hear all about you, please. Well, uh, when I came to the UK, I uh, was working mainly with Dwake. Uh, it's a game company. We are proud to have launched uh, games for Xbox One and Steam. Uh, we had a great partnership with the DIT. And of course, uh, we'll go through that later, but a lot happened when I entered the UK and I learned so much about what it is to be an immigrant and what it is to build a company from the scratch in another country. And uh, this is something that not only happened to me, but I could bring Hita with me. And now we have technology as, a, as the center of our business. And I started with a game company and now I have technology that involves games, of course, and so much else. Wonderful, we'll find out what yeah. that so much is later on in the <laughs> conversation. Uh, uh, Michael, I'm coming to you next, if that's okay. Uh, I miss you, Michael. I often see you in, the, in my office maybe once a week. I've missed you this last year. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Course, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for enjoying, inviting me to join. Uh, my name is Michael French. I'm the, I run something called Games London. So as Sam mentioned, actually, we're very closely affiliated with UKI. Uh, obviously, so if you think of them, they're a national body. We're uh, local. We're for London. And we're funded by the Mayor's Office. And our whole programme is about supporting games businesses here, um, talking about, you know, getting investors understanding what the opportunity is in London and also things like talking about some of the cultural institutions here. A lot of the work we do kind of culminates every year in something called the London Games Festival. It's a little, a little bit like big. Um, and that's, you know, traditionally that was a big event where venues across the city would host uh, meetups, business events, consumer events. Obviously things are a little different in the last two years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a big success. We've, we've managed to use our, our government funding to, um, attract a lot of business for companies in in the city and beyond so yeah am i right in thinking you've just moved house as well yeah i'm new house and actually you might be able to hear the uh, the, the the trash is being collected right now <laughs> there's, uh, there's yes. people mowing mowing yeah. the garden next door here so it's all going on in the background but um i'm glad the internet works in the new house it often takes months to get it sorted so well yeah. done I'm, uh, I'm very, very lucky to, yeah lucky so far yeah Catherine, coming to you, um, tell us a bit about your amazing development studio. Oh, thank you. And thanks for having me on the panel today. I'm um, I'm founder of a company called State of Play. Uh, we've been running for about 14 years now and longer in the industry as well. Um, so we're, we are an independent studio. We make games often not as traditional as some may, may think. So one of our most famous games called Lumino City was all made out of paper and card. Um, 
with um, a, a working windmill in it and things like that. And then we've also just launched a game um, called South of the Circle. Well, say just launched six, seven months ago, um, which was set in Antarctica, which we did a research trip to Antarctica to, um, to find out about it. And that's been four years in development. So we're kind of like pushing the boundaries with what games are. And we always kind of like to have a really creative um, output with that. I'm also, I've worked with Sam and Michael before, and I'm on the board of directors of Yuki. Um, so I've been on that for six years. So a lot of involvement in kind of the UK industry that way as well. And just for clarity, you went to Antarctica as a research trip for your game. Is that what you said? Yes. So why aren't you doing games based in, I don't know, the Bahamas or... Well, this or is it, this is it. Exotic places. You know? you know, and then when we kind of try and come up with games that, like, are based 10 miles away, it's like, what? what's the point? <laughs> where, do we, where do we want to go on holiday next? Let's, <laughs> let's do that. But right. Then, yeah, so the motivation that. for game oh, development, I love it. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to stay with you, Catherine, actually, if that's all right, oh, while, while you've yeah. unmuted yourself. This, let's, uh, let's keep this flow going. Um, interesting. It's always good to, to start a conversation um, uh, where you're looking at something like the UK to look at what's happened to the latest trends in the, in the UK games industry. And unfortunately, we can't really do that without talking about what's happened in the last 14 months and the impact of the, of the pandemic. So I'd like to hear from you first, if that's OK. Uh, some of the trends that you're seeing in the UK market, and it might be pandemic related, might not be, but anyway, trends you're seeing in the market and the kind of the impact that's having on your particular business, if that's okay. Yeah, well, regarding the pandemic, I mean, we kind of like set up, uh, like packed up our London office, like in February, it was like, see you in a few weeks till this blows over. <laughs> and then since then, we've, we've all worked remotely. Um, you know, so that's that was a struggle coming to an end of a project and things like that. But we all kind of like found ways to work around it. You know, we're, we're hoping to get back in the office, um, sort of set up an, another office soon. So we still have that kind of, um, I think, working together is, is really good when you're doing creative things. In terms of trends, it's always really like this industry, as you all know, like changes at a drop of a hat. But, you know, I think the confidence the industry has at the moment, you know, and relatively, you know, we're all able to work quite well digitally. I feel like, you know, personally for independent games, it's quite ambitious at the moment with the projects that are coming through. Um, there's some fantastic, you know, developers making fantastic games at the moment. And I think the confidence people have in kind of really pushing the boundary I'm seeing come through and especially for us with, possibly our next game. So yeah, I think that's that's how I see it. Are you about to reveal what your next game is? Are we gonna have a world exclusive? No. <laughs> no, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Moving on quickly from that then. <laughs> uh, Persis, I'm, I'm gonna come to you next. I mean, you, you made the move to another country uh, just as the pandemic came. <laughs> I mean, great timing. Um, tell us a little bit about your, I mean, so, sort of the effect Firstly, I guess the effect coming to the UK had on your business and then also yeah. things that you've experienced in the last year and perhaps some of those trends that we can talk about. Well, firstly, uh, before the transition, it was amazing the impact I had and I was uh, looking for not only investor, but a partner that will help my company to make that move. So I knew I would need lots of money. So I entered a project with a huge enterprise from the game sector. I can't tell it uh, the name, but I was expecting a $2 million investment when I got here. So I got on 9th of 2019 and one week later, it was locked down. So the world went crazy and I discovered the project uh, was postponed till the end of the pandemic. I knew what that meant at the time. So I knew uh, I wouldn't get that money. So I had a company that was ready to start working with the 2 million investment. And from one day to another, we're bankrupt. So it was devastating to me. And I knew that because the UK is such a powerhouse, uh, it will be really hard for me to, to just grab my sticks and go back to 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 build a tent and it was uh, a really bad time but at the same time i was in the uk and i knew if i if 
I'm the UK, I have opportunity. So I start l- looking for what I, I could done with, you know, the opportunity. And I realized that games, like Catherine said, we are always pushing the boundaries. We are always trying to do something better. Sometimes we are, you know, crushed by work, but we are always pushing forward and the tools we have are fantastic. And then I realized the UK has something that is quite magical that I didn't have in Brazil. That is uh, a sense of community and a sense of growing together that opened my mind. So I didn't have the money and I didn't have the company working at it used to work. But at the same time, I had this will to push boundaries and all other markets that I could uh, get into and and you know, give this technology. That's when I talked to Rita and she was uh, building this amazing company. And I thought, oh my God, gaming is something that if you're pushing your boundaries, we can push it together because uh, what we need in the pandemic is to teach, as she always says, uh, I'll get your, your, your line, Rita, but teach new things to old people. So what's the power of the game industry? to put someone in someone else's shoes and, and give them this expertise. So we start, you know, going wide with all the, the opportunities. And we said, okay, let's move to the UK and let's make this uh, thing uh, grow. So it was, it was bad for me to bankrupt, of course, but I was so lucky to be here. <laughs> so lucky. That's a lovely story. Um, a few more sort of um, hills and troughs than I expected, but thank you for that. Uh, and Rita, I'm going to come to you now. Although it sounds like Persis has taken all your best lines and used all your quotes, I can't believe it. But um, how has how has your business found, you know, in the last year? What are the sort of trends that you've seen affecting your business? Well, you know, uh, with the pandemics, uh, uh, as opposed to everybody else or most of the, the, the market, we grew a lot. Uh, I had never expected to grow so much because everybody had to stay home. So all the customer support, all the custom, all the, the CX industry had to send people home. And the solution uh, we work is like cloud solution that you don't need uh, to invest in, in any infrastructure, any technology. You just need a computer and a Google Chrome, and that's it. And you start, oh, and a headset, and you start talking, and, and your business uh, could uh, continue uh, moving. So we grew a lot, and we face something that in Brazil um, uh, it's been forever, but now get it got worse with the manpower. So we don't have enough developers, we don't have enough uh, technical people, you don't have enough uh, technology-related people, all kinds. I mean. You can choose uh, uh, expertise. So we grew a lot, and I was like uh, talking to him and saying, "Oh my God, I need to hire developers. I'm, I'm crazy after developers." And he goes, "Oh, come here, let's find the developers." <laughs> and you know, you you have all these universities. Uh, we work with uh, artificial intelligence as well. So we were looking for like a manpower that could support us in this uh, product development that we have. We have actually uh, uh, build a product uh, using other everybody, uh, other companies' products. So it's like a Lego uh, type of solution. And so you need people to understand uh, different systems. So uh, then that's how we start talking. And, and we now have like, I, I uh, in 19, I was uh, making zero. And in 2000, we, we made like $1.5 million. Uh, uh, so it's like, oh my God. <laughs> and, and we had to run, like we had to set up our contact centers in like, we did one for a healthcare company in uh, three nights and two days for 800 agents because they had to send people away and they couldn't afford, you know, they had to, to change the solution, Technologi- uh, technologically speaking, radically change. So, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, like his bad story and my uh, uh, happy story, we 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 tight and you know it's a happy story. Yeah, in the end, that's a good that's a good success for the two of you, which I'm delighted to hear. Yeah. It's interesting, mm-hmm. you know, in times of crisis, certain industries rise to it, and the and the games industry because of the people we employ, the creative thinking we have has enabled us to to drive forward. The recruitment question is really 
Interesting. We'll come back to that later if we have time, because um, that's a real mm -hmm. challenge for, for all uh, game yeah. industries around the world at the moment. Uh, Michael, coming coming to you, I mean, you do events. I mean, oh, my <laughs> word. What's it been like? And, um, and and what are the sort of the, the trends that you've seen, things you've learned from that we might be you know, using going forward from you on that on the event side? Yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, as soon as the uh, the the lockdown hit, and and I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a tricky one because I think as as anyone in events was watching the kind of the global situation from January last year, and the the only unfortunate, you know, the, the, oh, sorry, not the only unfortunate, that's, it's, I'm misspeaking there, but you know, the issue that our event was last year was in March, and the lockdown happened like two weeks before we were supposed to take place. Now, obviously, prior to that. We had to pull things anyway because we knew things weren't happening. But it just, it, it just totally changed the way um, you'd consider how events work. I think, you know, there's been, there's been so everything we've done in the last fourteen months has been online, obviously, like everybody else. But what's actually been interesting in that is the, it's it's levelled off a lot of access to these events, and I think there's there's there are more events than ever. So it's actually it's actually really hard if you're a biz dev person, you know. Um, knowing where the right place to go is having so many options and you know the ticket prices are like it's it's so shotgun on on the you know what what events are free and which events cost a couple of hundred dollars and and what the value is on each um but the the access is is it has improved in that sense you can you you know there have been companies in fact two of the studios that we've worked closely with raised money in the last year through a, through an investor that's just basically called themselves a zoom investor because all their meetings have been on video calls and and obviously, obviously, historically, you would you would have a meeting at a show, and then you might be, and then you might have an investor come and visit you, and you might do some due diligence. And you know, there's a whole there's a whole different um, mindset around that. Um, in events, for us, it meant about you know finding as many ways possible to kind of do what we do for mass for more people. And you know, events events in a similar vein to to, to big. You know, it's about getting people to log on. Where, where it's a challenge is people feel really fatigued by some of those things these days and I, you know I think um Persis was right you know game developers you know around the world it's it's you know there's a great spirit in the UK and in London but it's actually it's a global no matter which developer you speak to they're so passionate um but you know to do it every day sit at a computer every day is has its challenges so yeah it's it's been interesting you know we we tried doing different things during the most recent games festival for instance like taking our attendees to an, an online escape room and just finding things to do that kind of change the dynamic of how you might meet someone and um, because obviously everyone's sat in the same room every day you're not getting to see anybody and you have to figure out how that how can you make a digital conversation complement you know your your digital life and your, your sorry your digital work and you know where does a meeting end and where does your work end and stuff? So it's been it's been interesting. I you know I, I actually really I've had sort of enjoyed watching lots of other smaller events, including mine. I think kind of step up to meet that challenge because you know mm -hmm. you know studios want to get out there more. We you know like you said, it's it's uh, it's boom time for games right in a pandemic. Um, more people playing games than ever and we can't make games quick enough. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting con almost conundrum there. You know, we're not allowed to travel anywhere to do any business development, but we need to do more of it. And we need to do it online 100% of the time. And it's not just been the playing of games. It's been the fact that playing online in a community has given you that contact and that social interaction with other people, which has been amazing and rewarding. You know, the games industry has absolutely played its part in that, but mainly our consumers, our players, have built those communities and that's been that's been fabulous for them while i've still got you michael what um you know thinking about um what's going to happen after lockdown with be positive let's look forward yeah. um what are the things that you are going to keep doing that you've learned in lockdown that you're going to continue to bring to events in the future yeah i, th I think for us it's that it, it's it's that making sure people who aren't there geographically can be part of it and you know, I think, our, as you can imagine, our, our in, the proportion of international attendees that come to, that came to the London Games Festival this March versus the prior year, had gone up significantly. And we had, you know, we had we had three, no, we had three overseas delegations visiting, and you know, had they had games in our official selection, they had investor meetings, and that demand is higher than we've ever seen it. Even even when we had the the kind of the luxury of being, you know, in in the 
before the pandemic being able to say well you should come to london the culture's great the the the, the atmosphere is amazing and you get to meet you know you get to be part of this games event but also in this capital city of ours and actually you know um a bit leveling off that access and making it accessible is, is what was is what was more um we none of us realized it was the most important thing so i think next year's games festival and any of our events in future you know it's all about making sure we fit we're connecting to everyone around the world yeah that connection thing's important isn't it and and catherine looking at it from a sort of a studio developer perspective what what's your office going to look like in the future how are you going to do business development what's going to change or are you um, just going to go back to pre-lockdown what do you think no i don't think i don't think we'll ever be in an office five days a week again um personally i mean we're lucky we can we can both myself and founders company you know we can both work from home fairly easily and we can we through the pandemic you know you had to learn ways of you know working with people and and it kind of we found a way i mean i think we do miss especially in early stage of development with games we miss that kind of like round table let's all thrash an idea out you know and sometimes the barrier of zoom it's just like you know you can kind of get there i mean the other thing um michael touched on you were saying about events it's like what i think i miss not necessarily like the go into a conference and what and learning something it's the kind of stuff around it all that you know the beer you, the beer here and stuff there and you know i've done so many business uh, business deals in like gdc bars and stuff that you know and and it's that weird kind of like natural like um way of talking to people because there is this uh, and again i've done virtual kind of relaxation you know a relaxed atmosphere thing and i i still find it hard to kind of i don't know just relax into them so i think i think that's what what i'm looking forward to coming back to the london games festival 2022 but we can sit and have a chat <laughs> in the same room. So yeah. And, and I like the idea of getting to go to big maybe next year. Going over oh, to yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm keen to book my tickets now if things are normal. So yeah. This is this is it. This is a great opportunity. We've we've all been to shows that we've never been to before, game shows around the world, and it's absolutely opened our eyes for more opportunities. Um, so we're talking about that sort of um social interaction and 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 taking that that leap and working together as a team. I mean. Persis, you made an enormous leap. You left your country and came and set up in the UK. Um, I'd be really, I'm really keen to hear about your sort of motivation for coming to the UK. What were the things that persuaded you to to set up in the UK, and how have you found the experience so far? Well, uh, when we talk about motivation, I, I used to say that we have to look to two things. First is the business, and the second is your personal life. No, it's really important for you to be happy where you are. And, and sometimes people talk to me about the UK and how great it is. And I always ask, do you need to see the sun every day? It, it's kind of, <laughs> you know, are, are you sad when it's cloudy? And if the person says, yes, I leave for the sun, I say, look, another place. It's not that, it's not, I don't think it's the bad weather, but you, you have to understand that uh your personal life will be at stake at the same time you know we you, i came with my family i was worried about if they will be you know uh fine with with all this transition so first thing is your personal life and how you fare with what is the, the uk and and how is the country so look to your look to your inner self something like that uh, the second part is your business, and here things are way easier than uh, in Brazil. For instance, when you're making games, it's too risky, and sometimes you have to, you know, build a company and test, iterate, uh, pivot, and if you don't make it, you have to close the company. And this process in Brazil, it's a nightmare. People are, are running away from closing the company. When you get a partner, it's almost like a marriage. You're stuck to, to you know the rest of your life, and it's it's that hard. And we're talking about a highly competitive industry that needs iteration and needs you to take risks and maybe move forward. So when I was in Brazil, it was so hard to move forward. 
And I was stuck to the same process over and over that uh, when I started talking to the IT, I realized that I had uh, that the UK is a best is a great place for you to to learn to research and move on to to a brighter future. So uh, this was a, a big motivation. And at the same time, if you have a bad you know month in Brazil, you're doomed because you won't be able to pay your kids' school, or you know you won't have. Uh, uh, your health system may degrade. Uh, it's really stressful. When you're here, you're way more focused on your job and moving forward because you know at the end of the month, you know basics for a family are guaranteed. So it gives you a, you're more relaxed working. Uh, you are more relaxed when you go out to grab your kids at school. You have you know this this quality of life that. I didn't have in Brazil, and it was really stressful. So when I put it all together, and I said, "Oh my God, I actually love the the, the weather in in the UK and uh, how it is, the the English accent, uh, you know, things that uh, we have here." It was amazing for me and for my wife, and we talked a lot. And I said, "Okay, my wife will be happy, I will be happy, and my business can uh, grow." So. Uh, it, I know the UK is the right place for me. So it, it, it is, and actually Huddersfield, if you want, I can talk about <laughs> it now or, or, or leave the room for the other. You tell, tell us about Huddersfield. I mean, I've been to Huddersfield. It's a nice place. It's one of it's one of many cities in the north of England, but I wouldn't necessarily go to Huddersfield ahead of some of the other northern cities. So tell me a little bit about it. Well, I'll tell you something that will get people crazy, but it's cheaper to live in Huddersfield than in Sao Paulo. So if you're thinking that it will be more expensive to come to the UK, it will not. If you go to London, of course it will be more expensive, but you know, Huddersfield, like other small uh, cities or towns in, in the UK, they're, they're almost like heaven, you know, they're safe. And with the pandemic, we are doing everything digitally. So I can grab a train and go to Leeds in, 20 minutes, go to Manchester in one hour, I think, go to uh, London in two hours and a half. So if we are always working from home and we are having, you know, some events or some people that we would like to talk, we just move to them and go back home. So Huddersfield's a fantastic place. People used to think like, oh, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's not, you know, it, it's, it's like, I think something that can, you know, boost your company because you're in a place that is easy to build a company and it's cheap to live and will guarantee you the basics for your life. So I, I have nothing to complain. It's such a great place. Well, that's amazing advert for the yeah. UK. Thank you. I'll get the tourist board to get in touch with you and they can... Uh... <laughs> They'll get you. I mean, and what I also like about, about you, Percy, it's apart from your, your great fun, you know, UK people have a reputation for going on about the weather a lot. And here you are, you've mentioned it twice already. You've only been living here for 18 months, yeah. been indoctrinated into our, our language for sure. If you ask me how, how am I, I'll say not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. Uh, Rita, uh, and, um, you set up an office in the UK. Have you found that to be not bad? I mean, how have you found that experience? <laughs> yeah, I have been to UK, but I do like sun. <laughs> so <laughs> if I have to move, I would have to move to a sunny place. You know, <laughs> it's a uh, entire life uh, cultivated in the sun. And, you know, here we don't have a weather change like uh, uh, other countries like yourselves. I mean, it, for us, it's like uh, our same weather in winter here is like your summer. So I would die. <laughs> How about setting up a business? How did you find that when you, you set up an oh, office in the UK? How was easier. that experience? Yeah, no, very easy. I mean, I, I can't say how easy it is, it is compared to, to what we where we live. So, it, you know, everything in life is all relative. So if you compare to here, it's you probably find something that you don't like. But if you live here and you go back there, you would love it, like purses. <laughs> so it's a lot easier than here. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to come to you in, in a couple of minutes to kind of sell the UK development perspective. So I'm just setting you up so that you can think about it. 
There's a lot um, of pressure there, Sam. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff here. But um, I do want to go back to, to Rita and Persis, and, and it might be a very short answer, but um, I've, I've lined up a question of what would you do differently if you did it again? And it, if you've had any problems. So maybe the answer is nothing. I would just do the same thing. But, but um, anything you would do differently? No. No. I would do faster. I would start uh, earlier, you know. Yeah. Start earlier. Okay. Yeah. All right. You heard it here, ready. audience. Yeah. <laughs> and you, Persis, would you do anything differently? No, I think uh, at least the story I have now is it's a great story. It was really stressful, but no, I I chose the right place. See, Catherine, I did give you a couple of minutes notice, but it's coming around a little bit quicker. So, um, you know, wh why is the UK so good for developers and for games companies? Um, so for us, and like I can only speak for myself, I think like the creativity we have in this country, it's just kind of like, it's easy to find. Like the talent that we, you know, as a, as a like small to medium sized business, we, you know, and especially, you know, being in areas where there's a lot of like graduates, really, really good graduates, you know, uh, you know, every year we have, you know, you see people, you know, it's not hard to, hire really exceptional developers and artists here. Um, you know, the cultural links and I know, and again, when, you know, because of the pandemic, pandemic, it's sort of like been the culture, you know, we haven't had it, but you know, even things like the support we've had from BAFTA um, throughout the years, you know, it's, you know, it's so sort of natural and easy to have that sort of support. You kind of take it for granted, but um, being able to kind of, you know, we work with incredible script writers, you know, that's Baf people like BAFTA can put us in touch with that. Um, and again, and I think a few people have mentioned it, the kind of community and the support, you know, from the small pub meetups in North London, when you're setting up with other independent developers to the kind of Yuki putting us in touch with lawyers to help us sign a contract, that's just, it's just easy. It's easy to kind of have access to that and, and, you know, setting up a company and, you know, having a company for like nearly 15 years, it, it's all been really vital. And I don't know another country where we could have that at such, um, such ease. And yeah, so really the kind of cultural significance on, of living in the UK for us has been really important with the sort of games that we make. Yeah, it's amazing. That's that's great. Thank you. I've I've written it down. That's how I'm going to pitch the UK in the future. Thank you for that. I'm going to come to you in a second, Michael, to talk about sort of culture and the London Games Festival and that kind of thing. But just one more thing um, that I've sort of explored in the last year is as I deal with more Brazilian studios, we talk about Catherine. You talk about the creativity in the UK and 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 also the technical capabilities. You know, there's no place in the world that has that really perfect mixture of creativity and technology together. You go to China, they're great at making games, but perhaps they don't quite have that sort of creativity that you want. And um, Brazil has both of it. I mean, the Brazilian games development market in the UK one is surprisingly similar in terms of the talent. I've been amazed to see some of the talent coming out of Brazil. So um, long may that continue. Um, Michael, talking about culture. So the London Games Festival loves to talk about culture and the UK culture. Is that is that integral to the festival? Is it is it what makes the festival different? Or, I mean, could what you do actually work in different countries, do you think? I mean, I, I actually think, I think that the, the, the model we have could definitely be used in other territories. I think what we what we what we did from the get-go was 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 to be kind of forthright in saying that we're very proud that this that our country our city has a lot of people in it playing games a lot of people understanding games and mm. you know, the very first festival we did um back in 2016 we had you know 35 different events and, and, and some of them were pre-existing consumer events for like thousands of people but we did that extra bits and pieces to fill in the gaps and you could really feel that you know the the the, the, the and this is outside of the business the business stuff people just people do just love games they understand games they recognize games it's you know britain's history in video games is is really well known so that, that's carried through over the years but i think and i think other territories are you know we're at a point now internationally where games are such a massive pastime 
and all of these different clusters um and so you know and some of them like people might not realize especially like for instance the scale of the brazilian sector is just it, it, there's there's a real opportunity there to talk about what makes your local country your local uh, talent so successful and how that translates internationally i mean we obviously we use the festival what, what we what we try and make the festival how we make the festival different sorry to some of the other events out there because there's a lot of established big international video games events is you know we try and talk about the qualities that make london special and interweave it with that and use that as our way to kind of you know talk about british creativity and, and some of the quirkiness here and um i think it, it really interesting that kath was talking about bafta you know bafta games awards are part of our festival and you know but also the, that that this kind of new area of heavily story driven games there's a lot of them being made in the uk and you know we we will find something i think that really relates internationally and try and convey that outwards but i, I yeah i definitely think you know i'd love to see more events crop up like ours around the world because i think the the sub some of the bigger trade shows might have a slight you know i, I don't not raise questions about their future but they have a very different dynamic and in a pandemic world i think we kind of feel and this is going back to what i was saying earlier that we sort of feel geography's become irrelevant but actually i think it's more relevant than ever because you know where you're sat right now when doing your work and i'm actually not in london i live just north of london it's actually it, it really, really matters to you and that Everybody takes that really seriously. It has a real pride in where they are now. So that's why I think it matters more than ever. So, yeah, I think I think I'd love to see other shows do do, do what we do and try and do what we do and 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 work with them because that that's also been really useful for us is kind of international collaboration. Um, I'm going to ask you thirty seconds about access to finance and the finance market. But firstly, I'm just going to um, congratulate Catherine for something that happened years ago. You won a BAFTA, wasn't that amazing? I mean, we talk about BAFTA Games Awards. This is premium video game awards. And, and yeah. I, was, I was sitting next to you and Luke when you won um, it. Yeah, so I think it was 2015 we won. So Luminosity was a game, like really small budget, really small team. And we were up for artistic achievement, as well as some other awards that night. But we um, we beat like Assassin's Creed and huge um, multi-million pound games to win that yeah and made in france and canada we don't care about them so well done you yeah amazing. yeah that, and things like that like I'm, i can talk about that for ages and for, but things like winning a bafta for us you know it it changed changed our lives like in terms of what that meant for our company the reputation it got you know and like there was no looking back from that so 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 yeah we were ever so grateful for that and it sits it's in the next room on my it's in the next room yeah amazing uh, I am going to come back to money now, if that's all right, Michael. So we heard earlier, Persis... Sam, disaster. sorry, Sam, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we only have 10 more minutes and we have some questions. So I'd just like to give you a heads up if you want to start the Q&A or put a Q&A right next after your questions. Right. I will look at those questions and work them in. But Michael, while I'm uh, moving off screen to look at questions, a little bit about the, the finance market. We heard from Persis, you know, the importance of bringing finance in and, and growing a business on finance. You run an amazing finance market. Tell us a little bit about that and 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 why people should consider signing up for that in the future. Yeah, definitely. So if you so, so if you're and you are about to start fundraising, um, go to games.london, sign up for our newsletter, and you'll get updates on this event. But something we've run at the Games Festival, as Sam says, since we started, is the games finance market. And um, I think there's like I, I don't know, I said there's no shortage of events, right? Shortage of events where um, you can attend and you know there's quality investors there. And the event we put together, um, I mean, when it was face-to-face -face in, in you know, the real world, it was over two days. This, this, re this last month, we ran it over four days, and we put a lot of effort into uh, an application process, so you don't necessarily get to buy a ticket, you have to apply, and we, have to, we check your application, and we look at things like your budget and your presentation deck and your track record and, you know, way up. If you're a new studio but have a great idea and some funding already, then you you know, how does that match versus the and who we let in and then we spend the, the we, year round we're trying to talk to investors about this event and get them signed up to come along and um, we had more uh, more investors than ever sign up this year and even when it was an online thing and, and as i was saying people are more fatigued so you know there's de still is demand out there and the event you know it's focused, the speed dating model we give people a schedule they have to log on do the meetings and they're intro meetings but they, I think investors know in those short space of time and we've seen lots of great follow-ups and you know there's, there's, there's a little bit of magic in there in our matchmaking I, I always say because you know you can buy 
a GDC or an E3, and you can meet some of these companies. But you know, when we've been speaking to the investors, but we also know the list of studios, we can kind of make the better matches. So, um, yeah, it, you know, we're not alone in running those kind of events. But I think the ones there aren't many of us that that put a lot of legwork into the whole match things up. So it runs every year. We we run sort of satellite events here as well. So we might have a similar a similarish thing coming up later in the year. But it's it's all emblematic of the fact that. The access, accessing funding is difficult, uh, but there are investors out there who want to give money to games. And, you know, when there's companies like Cats in London that we can say, look at this company, you know, you can invest in the next day of play or, or invest in state of play. Um, you know, sign up the games from these companies. It's a, it's a really attractive proposition. And um, uh, maybe let people know how they can sign up for that because they can sign up from anywhere in the world, can't they, for the finance? Yes, it's open to everyone around the world. It's, it's not it's not just a for London or for the UK thing. And actually, um, the, the, the investors like the fact that we have a, a wide pool of people attending because I think there's that other thing, like, you know, that's where geography isn't relevant. They want to spend the shortest amount of time seeing the, the, the largest number of high-quality pitches. So, so, like I say, if you go to our games.london website, um, there's information on there. Right. I've got hundreds of questions lined up, but I'm going to scoot through some of these that are coming from the audience. So, um, first, is a question to you. What tips do you give for Brazilians who want to come to the UK market? What's the what's the sort of the first three or four things they should do if they want to come to the UK? I was thinking about that question, actually. Uh, well, first of all, games, uh, they're a, a global product. You're setting everywhere. So if you don't think globally, you are already doomed. So first of all, if, if, you, if you get my example, I used to sell games from Brazil. I still do. Uh, when I sell from Brazil, I pay taxes for, uh, on the US and I still pay taxes in Brazil. So double taxation. Uh, it's impossible to compete if you're not money wise. Uh, in the UK, we have so many options. You, you should look for, for instance, you don't need to be in the UK to have a company in the UK. Uh, you have a lot of opportunities that you must grab. If you are staying as a developer only and you want to sell globally through a publisher, find a publisher that suits your needs and pay you in, in your country and, and you know, be tax-wise. If you're planning to self-publish or do something global, you have to think global. So don't think in that Brazil will uh, be your answer because it is hard for us to sell from uh, from Brazil. It is good because our workforce is cheap compared to pounds or, or dollars. Uh, but at the same time, it's tricky to have the company there and you have to spend a lot of time with your accountant and with your, uh, you know, tributary uh, lawyer. And sometimes we take so much time thinking about it that it's easy to forget about the game itself and we don't put that much effort in the game. So think globally, look at the UK opportunities. I think I'm not saying because I'm here, but I know we have opportunities in the UK. So talk to the DIT. The they will help you to find something that can boost your company. Does that make sense, Ritu? Do you agree with all that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and what about, there's a, a question here from um, a studio, I think that is, is still based in Brazil that's saying, um, you know, we might be looking at the UK, but we want to stay in Brazil for a little bit longer. It's an interesting question. Is there a, is there a good time in the life cycle of a studio to perhaps make that move internationally? Is there a, is there a perfect time for that, do you think? Well, you know, um, because of the pandemic and the, the, the Brazilian situation, we cannot uh, travel. There are some countries that don't allow us to, to enter. So, uh, but it's still, you still can work from here. Like I am here, I cannot travel. I'm here working with persons and, and other companies. Uh, we are doing business uh, from Brazil with UK, with Africa. So you can do that. You know, it's it's a it's a new era uh, of techno technology. You know, the pandemic uh, um, made you know this uh, technology adoption faster. You know, because of uh, wrong reasons, but uh, help help us that we work in technology space. So you can you can work from wherever you are. Our company, we have nobody in the office. 
and we're never going to go back to the office. You know, we're going to be all home based. I mean, we, we say home based, but it's more, it's more like we are living at, uh, at the office <laughs> instead of having an office <laughs> at home, you know? <laughs> That's another story, but we can talk this in another time. But yeah, you can be here and sell everywhere. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question asking about has the UK started to hire developers from overseas? Um, absolutely. The UK market, although we have lots of highly qualified and skilled developers, every studio in the UK uh, is recruiting. The, the headcount has gone up dramatically in the last year. We don't have enough talent ourselves. And whereas in the past, we might be encouraging people to move to the UK to work in a because everyone is working remotely, just as Rita said, that means you don't need to be based in the UK anymore. So a lot of overseas talent currently being recruited by the UK. So check those jobs boards, get in touch with those companies, have a look at the opportunities. There's terrific opportunities there and you can stay where you are and still work for those companies. There was a question about the UK embassy in Brazil offering support. Uh, absolutely, if you're a Brazilian company, you want to look at the UK, I would get in touch with the Department for International Trade. First and foremost, they're the specialist government office to help people look at international markets. You can also get in touch with me at Yuki. Um, Yuki are um, recognized for helping lots of international businesses set up offices in the UK. We have an amazing network of people. It's one of our key offerings that we do. Um, just to, um, we're going to go really off piece here with a final, a final question. We've got two minutes left, so we're going to scoot through this pretty quickly. Um, Michael, what do you think we should be looking out for in the future for the UK? What are the sort of the big key messages that we want to leave our audience thinking about today? Where's the, maybe where the games industry is going, what the UK is doing? What, what do you think the future holds for us? Uh, to be really quick, I actually think the point before about hiring from all over, um, you know, we've, it, it, it was already a really resilient sector. We've proved our resilience. And like you say, the, 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 there are vacancies open for all kinds of roles. There's, there's something like 400, 450 open jobs in game development in London alone at the moment. And so there's mm -hmm. huge opportunities. And I think that's, I think the, one of the things that has come out of the pandemic is our, our confidence in being able to work that way. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And Catherine, what about um, maybe even the future for state of play? What's, what, what, what are you going to be working on in the in the near and not too distant future? Yeah, similar to what Michael says, just kind of growth and working with talented people wherever they are. Um, so that's going to be really important for us and just, you know, working on more creative games, hopefully. Wonderful. And plan those holidays alongside it. That always sounds like a good plan. <laughs> um, last thoughts from you, Rita? final thoughts to share with our audience okay well you know uh like i said in the beginning uh it's a really good support that uh the the, the uk government provides to everyone that wants to go abroad and uh as something that uh, Catherine said about the the creativity and and the open mind you know i think our culture is sim in a way similar to yours in this perspective so he, he, of course there are a lot of differences but but uh, the uh, the creativity that the game market needs and the software market needs, you know, we, I think we may uh, speak the same language. So it's not a difficult uh, approach. It's not a difficult interaction as opposed to other countries. So I think this is a good, um, good thing to, to take into consideration to move or to work there from here. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And final thoughts from you, Persis, just the last couple of seconds, I think. Any final roundup thoughts you have? To be really quick, if you're planning to move, don't you ever be ashamed of your accent. It is proof of your bravery. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> More pearls of wisdom from Persis at the end there. Bruno, I'm going to hand back to you. But before I do so, I just want to thank DIT for getting us involved in this today, to thank Catherine, Michael, Rita, Persis, and our audience for listening to us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sam, for moderating this panel. I'd like also to thank Julia, who was here at the beginning, and Catherine, Michael, Chris, and Rita. The panel was really good. Lots of great insights here. And for those of, uh, for those of you who are watching, don't forget to share the link to our channel and tag your friends to also attend Big Festival 2021 and check what we're doing. Big Festival 2021, the biggest games festival in Latin America.